Good evening. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the New York Public Library. Welcome to those of you who joined us last night for part one of this lecture series, and welcome to those of you here for the first time tonight. My name is Martha Hodes. I'm interim director of the library's Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers. Please note that this event is being recorded. I also encourage you to re remain masked, and I kindly request that you silence your cell phones. Thank you. Allow me to repeat from yesterday that the application for fellowships from the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers are now available on our website along with our public programming called Conversations from the Coleman Center, and our new lineup for public programming will begin in September. Well, because many of you here uh, were with us last night, I'm not going to repeat all my words about the origins of the Joanna Jackson Goldman Memorial Lectures, uh, or my extended introduction to our esteemed speaker, Jamel Bowie. Nonetheless, I will say this for our newcomers, and please indulge me if you were with us last night. Joanna Jackson Goldman was a lover of books, an advocate for competing ideas and strenuous debate. She was a believer in the potential of American democracy, including the struggles necessary to achieve that potential. The lectures delivered in her honor are intended to encourage provocative comment and analysis of contemporary issues of deep and long-term significance for American democracy. That mandate could not be more timely. I again extend my very sincere gratitude to Daniel Hevlis, past Coleman Center Fellow and Professor Emeritus at Yale University, and to Alan Porter, the executor of the estate of Eric Goldman, Joanna's husband. Together, Dan and Alan created this endowed lecture series. At the conclusion of this evening's talk, we welcome questions from you, the audience. Please feel free to line up at the microphone that will be set up in the aisle and the lights will come up. Because we'd like to take as many questions as possible, do keep your questions brief and to the point. Now to our distinguished speaker. Many of you know Jamel Bowie from his columns in the New York Times. Jamel Bowie's principal concern is the undermining and subversion of American democracy. The persistent strain, those are his words, of anti-democratic exclusion that runs through the nation's history. Indeed, Jamel's great gift to his readers is his always discerning summoning of history from the American Revolution to the Civil Rights Movement and beyond. I say discerning because while Jamel's columns frequently invoke the past in order to understand our present moment, those parallels are always complex and nuanced. Last evening, Jamel pondered the question, what's the matter with American democracy? This evening, he takes on the topic, the future of American democracy. Perhaps a clue lies in the title of one of his recent columns, quote, I have a handle on history, the future is a different story. But another clue emerged yesterday evening when Jamel hinted at a not entirely pessimistic appraisal of the future of American democracy. Like Joanna Jackson Goldman, Jamel Bowie implores us to think hard about the world around us. I'm honored once again to welcome him with very warm anticipation, and please join me in doing so. Those of, those of you who were here last night know that I need to drink the water um, before I get started. I uh, thank you for coming out. I am really looking forward to continuing this discussion for last night, and I'm really grateful that those of you, I'm grateful that y'all have come out, and that for those of you who were here last night, I'm grateful that you came back. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little afraid that my assessment of the future of American democracy, it, it's, it's not optimistic, 
Um, it's not as pessimistic as it might be, but it's not necessarily optimistic. But we'll, we'll get to all of that. Uh, for those of you who were not in the audience yesterday evening, I spoke about the problem with American democracy. I said that the problem with American democracy was that it wasn't democratic enough and that it lacked in particular political equality. I rooted the lack of political equality and thus the lack of democracy in the US Constitution and the institutions of the American political system. And I made the point that for all of our progress over the last 250 years or so, as much as we have tried successfully to shoehorn democratic principles into the American system, we have, um, we both have quite a while ago, and we also have to recognize that the, the non-democratic part of the American system um, can reassert itself, that it's, you can only go so far in a system like ours before things begin to snap back a bit like a rubber band, before old patterns start to reassert themselves. My plan for tonight is to talk about that snapback, not as an automatic feature of American political life, not some sort of you know, automatic backlash, but as the direct product of a methodical political strategy, and a political strategy that relies on the counter-majoritarian and anti-democratic institution of the United States to move forward. To the detriment of many millions of Americans, I think the future of our democracy is actually gonna look a lot like the past of it, and the past of it wasn't all that great for many of us. We will get there in the course of this discussion, but to start, I want to talk about what I would describe as Americans' as democratic anxieties. Uh, if you read headlines of any news publication, you will get a very strong sense that many Americans are feeling very anxious about the state of US democracy. Here are a few from CNN. Most Americans feel democracy is under attack in the US. From PBS, two out of three Americans believe US democracy is under threat. From MSNBC, just a very simple, American democracy is under attack, nice and declarative. And from my employer, the New York Times, uh, why political sectarianism is a growing threat to American democracy. At the moment, most of the worries about the state of American democracy tend to fixate on Donald Trump. And I think that's for a very good and obvious reason. He tried to seize power for himself. Many of us have been watching the January 6th hearings. We kind of know the details. He spent two months trying to subvert the process for counting electoral votes, and then when, the, when, the, when that did not work, he sent a mob to attack Congress. Very dramatic, um, and obviously does not bode well for uh, the state of American democracy. Especially when you consider that if things were just a little bit different, if the margin in the election were a little narrower, if there were more conservative elites on his side, that he might have actually succeeded. And so the extent to which we dodge the bullet here is a result of both you know, some organization and planning on the part of defenders of American democracy, but also just plain good luck. I think a big part of the fear since January 6th is that Trump will try to do this again. Uh, he'll take a second swing at it. He'll try to seize power for good, make himself emperor of America or something. I don't know. Um, I'm not really sure that it's quite his ambition. He seems to mostly just want to find some way to avoid uh, legal immunity from a lifetime of crime. But uh, it is true that Trump will try this again has been one of the themes of the hearings. And it's clear that he's going to run for president again. And if he's wins power again through that mechanism, things aren't really going to be that great for the country. In fact, one of the related fears about Trump, um, as we look ahead to the next presidential election, which, believe it or not, is a little over two years ago, which is disturbing, um, the fear is that he'll win with just outright majorities in the House and Senate. He'll have the Republican Party fully behind him once again. And then he'll use power from Washington to undermine his political opponents and foreclose any real possibility of his defeat in the future or the defeat of his allies in his party. Now, I don't think this is wrong exactly, but I'm not entirely sure that it's the right way to look at the threat to US democracy. Um, I think it's entirely correct to worry about the future of US democracy, but I think, and, and I think that this 
this fear about Trump is reflective of some maybe not misguided, but not quite right thinking about what that future is gonna look like. Specifically, I think Americans who are worried about Trump kind of becoming this autocrat are often importing references and ideas and images from abroad and from Europe in particular. But I don't think we need an image or example of European authoritarianism to understand what's happening in the United States. Um, we don't, yeah, get Europe out of here. Build the wall. I don't know. Um, we in the United States actually have our very own history of authoritarian and illiberal government, and thus we have a way to understand our current predicament as well as our possible futures without a need to turn to the experiences of another country. It's so useful to have that, that information, that knowledge, it's so useful to make international comparisons, but it's precisely because I think that Americans have actually gotten into the habit of thinking of the U.S. as exceptional, right, as thinking of authoritarianism as something that is some, something of an import to the U.S. and not something that's part of our own political traditions that I think it's useful to just ground things in the U.S. for a moment. So this, what you might call authoritarianism with American characteristics that I'm thinking of, rests on the federal structure of our government as well as our counter-majoritarian institutions. This is, I think, a little counterintuitive because Americans tend to think of federalism as part of the expression of our democracy, but I think you can see very clearly that it's often facilitated just the opposite. In fact, under our system, American federalism can be very easily turned against our democratic norms and our democratic culture, and then our national institutions can then be used to shield the anti-democratic turn in the states from federal intervention and federal interference. The threat to American democracy then comes from the institutions of the same. And I think with that in mind, we need to begin to think of the Constitution as one of the main obstacles to preserving the democratic tradition in the United States, as well as a tool for realizing it, right? So we think of the Constitution as a tool for realizing that tradition, but it might be better conceived of as a real obstacle, not just to defending it, but expanding it even further. To pick up on a point from last night's lecture, the standard view is that American democracy in its totality is expressed through the Constitution, that American democracy and the Constitution are kind of the same thing. They are, they are completely overlapping. But I don't think that's right. I think it's better to see the Constitution as a tool and an imperfect one at that um, to the larger end of self-government and democratic life. And the fact of the matter is, is the tool has always been a bit of an awkward fit for Americans seeking to express their democratic aspirations and their democratic ideas. It's done as much over our history to bind and block democracy in the U.S. as it has to make it a reality. And that's, of course, considering the fact that key features of the Constitution are arrayed against democratic values very explicitly. That something like a democracy even emerged out of the Founders' Constitution is, I think, a testament to the strength of Americans' democratic instincts over time. It's not, wasn't, it wasn't a guaranteed thing that that would happen. And in fact, many of the founders did not expect it to happen in that first decade. You could even imagine that if the Constitution had been a little easier to amend, if it weren't such an immense challenge to make any kind of significant change to the document, that Americans in previous generations would have made those changes, right? Would have made the changes to align the Constitution with their democratic instincts. Um, made the changes to, to, to make sure that democracy is very much a part of our constitutional settlement. But the Constitution is not particularly easy to change, and so they didn't. That didn't really happen. Um, the major amendments that we think of that really expand democracy, uh, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th amendments specifically, come out of a catastrophic war, and even those are highly limited, much, much weaker than they could have been. We've more or less spent this country's history trying to retrofit the Constitution to democracy um, and trying to make a culture of mass participation and civic equality fit within the confines of this document that wasn't really designed for them, that was designed to stymie majorities, enhance the power of elites, and limit democratic participation whenever it's possible. Those structures still remain, and that is ultimately the problem. Even with our formal and informal amendments, informal amendments, I'm thinking of the way that the Supreme Court at points has sort of read 
new rights and, and new protections into the document. Even with those formal and informal amendments, the anti-democratic and counter-majoritarian features of the Constitution and the American system remain. The states still exist as quasi-independent political entities, and they still have a ton of authority, even with the status quo of federal supremacy. The Senate, an institution where the, a majority of lawmakers can represent a minority of people and can block you know, a minority of lawmakers representing a majority of people, it still exists and it still acts as a massive uh, veto point for most legislation. The Supreme Court, which is effectively just a, a supranational legislature that acts on the whims of five robed tyrants, um, <laughs> still exists, still can make law. Uh, the Electoral College, obviously, with its distortions, still exists. And I think the important thing to recognize is that because of how these institutions are designed, because of how they are meant to work together, they can be weaponized very easily against democratic principles we otherwise think they should express. The great example in American history that I, I immediately jumped to um, is the way that the solid South, the solid democratic Jim Crow South, used a combination of the Senate, the filibuster, and the two-party system to stymie almost a century of attempts to protect the civil rights of black Americans. David Potter, a historian of the Civil War, called this period of US history, uh, this period of near Southern dominance over the American political system, as the century of the concurrent majority, which is an interesting phrase I'm gonna unpack because I think it's an important thing to, to really grasp. The concurrent majority re refers to a system where the political minority in the community has an absolute veto, negative, whatever you want to call it, on the operation of government. And it was the brainchild of John C. Calhoun, a South Carolina slaveholder and uh, politician and statesman, kind of a very important uh, pre-Civil War political figure who himself was preoccupied with the problem of minority rights. If I wish I wish I had sort of something to project, because John C. Cahoon's like the most striking looking person you'll ever see, kind of gaunt, big eyes, looks, looks like his beliefs would suggest that he looks like. <laughs> um, so minority rights for Cahoon were not, you know, minority rights as we would recognize them today. He wasn't concerned with the political and civil rights of religious minorities or racial minorities or anyone else. He was concerned with the influence of each distinct segment, um, economic segment, particularly in the political community. And he was especially preoccupied with the influence of his segment, the slaveholding planter class. It's, before I even go any further with this, it's worth asking why it's, you know, and why I'm going to spend a, bunch, a little time with this 19th century politician and political theorist whose main goal was preserving the slave system. Well, even though Calhoun's views were never institutionalized into a, you know, into a formal system, they were nonetheless very influential on the way the American political system unfolded, um, as Potter's quote suggests. Calhoun, I think, is a significant figure if you want to unpack and understand the way our democracy can work and the way our democracy has worked. And I think he's a significant figure when we're thinking about how an authoritarianism might manifest itself through federalism. He sort of can help us conceptualize what that might look like. And so here is a little more on John C. Calhoun. Calhoun came to reject the principle of majority and majority government, majority rule and majority government, during a fierce dispute over tariffs in the 18, early 1830s that you might remember as the nullification crisis. Named as such because Calhoun and his allies believed that the federal government could just nullify any federal law that it deemed unconstitutional. The basic problem for Calhoun when it came to majority rule is that even under a limited system of majority rule, which is what the U.S. was, with majorities mediated by separated powers and varying spheres of authority, those majorities could eventually coalesce to take action against the slave system and unravel the power of slaveholders. This was his, part of his opposition to the tariff, that a government that could levy heavy tariffs is a government that has the power to do much more than that. His allies uh, in, the, in the slave South, who were often opposed to you know, what they would describe as internal improvements, um, infrastructure, 
had a similar reasoning. If the federal government can use its power of the purse to build a canal where in, in a state, then what can't it do? For Calhoun, then, the only way to stymie majority is to rob them of their power within something that still looked like self-government was to give every portion of the political community this, this veto upon the others. And this negative, as I said earlier, was he called the concurrent majority. And I'm going to quote Calhoun here, um, and I'm going to let you know that this is the quote because I obviously do not speak 19th century American. Uh, so here's Calhoun. The concurrent majority gives to each division or interest through its appropriate organ either a concurrent voice in making and executing the laws or veto on their execution. It is only by such an organization that the assent of each can be made necessary to put the government in motion or the power made effectual to arrest its action when put in motion. And it is only by the, the one or the other that the different interests, orders, classes, or portions into which the community may be divided can be protected. Calhoun was a very powerful thinker, a very influential thinker. Um, R Richard Hofstadter called him the Marx of the master class, which I think is a very fitting description of him. And he recognized, Calhoun that is, that any functionally negative power exercised by any section of the nation, such as the South, would create an overall system where decisions were made jointly by the minority and the majority and not the majority alone. That it would essentially slow the process of government to a halt unless you could have total consensus. Now, I think in this moment of extreme polarization and partisanship, um, this idea actually has a little appeal. Um, policies can't be undertaken unless they have the widespread support of the entire population. Um, it even potentially gives vulnerable minorities in the society protection against potentially tyrannical majorities. But then you, you really have to consider the context of this idea. Again, the context of this idea is Calhoun's defense of the slave South and his defense of slavery. If the slave South held, held an absolute veto over the action of the federal government, then they could stop any attempt to intervene with slavery. Secession, which came about 10 years after Calhoun died, was sort of the ultimate culmination of this theory. Um, and at the very least, the Southern fire eaters, the Southern advocates of secession, who claim Calhoun's memory, certainly thought that they were acting in accordance with this idea. Now, the important thing, the, the, the significant thing, is that the conservatism inherent in the idea of the, con of the concurrent majority is why it appealed to many of Calhoun's political and intellectual descendants. The ability of Jim Crow elites, two generations later, to block federal action using this combination of institutions that acted as a de facto concurrent majority allowed them to act with almost total impunity in their states. <clears throat> These elites, state and county leaders of various stripes, as well as owners of land and capital, had virtually unchecked influence and power over the spheres in which they operated. And really, for a period in the Jim Crow South, other than sort of intra-elite competition between various segments of the bourgeoisie, you know, capital-owning, land-owning, trying to, to jockey for control of state government, there is really nothing that could keep them from dominating those below. You think of the, the populist Jim Crow senators of the early 20th century, um, guys like Jim K. Bardeman, and I, I say that like it's a name anyone would have any reason to know. Um, uh, Theodore Bilbo, I mean, there's a bunch of these guys, they all have very colorful names, they're all terrible. Um, but they often represented, say, the, uh, the sort of farmer, the white farming class or some other sort of uh, capital-owning elite versus, say, the, the elites of the predominantly or the largely black areas of the state. That was kind of the, the axis of competition. And that's where, that's where things were. But in terms of the idea that um, whites in the society had a right to rule, that white elites had sort of total control, that wasn't really contested. It was really an, an intra-class fight among this group. In this group, what they did successfully for the better part of a century was weaponize institutions of American democracy against democracy. They more or less smothered democracy in the South. Um, taking advantage of the counter-majoritarian features of our system as well as federalism 
to shield their systems of control and authority from national power and accountability. They could use their influence in the party system to more or less um, blackmail you know, leaders of the National Democratic Party, especially in the early 20th century, in the 1920s and 1930s, um, from interfering in their little arrangement because if they decided to exit, they could collapse the National Democratic Party in which they held a lot of sway. The other way to put this, and the way I like to put it, is that for most of a century, the supposedly democratic, freedom-enhancing constitution more or less enabled a one-party authoritarian state with dominion over millions of Americans, obviously millions of African Americans, but white Americans in the Jim Crow South weren't especially well-off either. Um, uh, the South was known for being a place with widespread and endemic poverty, um, with with way less political participation and representation for ordinary people than the rest of the country. Now, the combination of the New Deal and the Civil Rights Movement more or less smashed this system by its extension of national power. Obviously, the New Deal was circumscribed somewhat by the demands of the Southern Democratic Party. But in its extension of national power over economic life, um, the New Deal made a lot of headway. Southern elites could not fully resist this as much as they tried. And obviously, the legislative and uh, judicial wins of the civil rights movement extended federal power over social life even further, helped dismantle the Jim Crow system at its root. And it's those victories in the 1960s that are extremely significant when thinking about uh, the, the snapback of the American system. We tend to think of the 60s as simply the extension of rights and legal protection. To think of those victories as just the extensions of rights and legal, protect, legal protections. But I think those victories should be more conceived of as sort of the foundation for a set of universal social rights, an attempt to really give teeth to the Reconstruction Amendments, um, the 14th Amendment in particular. The 1960s were when the United States finally tried to make a reality the idea that there are meaningful and significant privileges and immunities due to all American citizens. And in, and in taking that step and sort of establishing a universal baseline of rights, uh, the U.S., the federal government, hindered the ability of local and state elites to establish their little autocracies and enforce their little hierarchies. For the defenders of these hierarchies, this was just a profoundly radical inversion of the social order. Like, imagine being a wealthy businessman in a small Georgia town. My, my mother's from a small Georgia town, so I have an image in my head of just like, you know, Mayberry, basically. Suddenly, without your support, without your consent, the people who work for you, maybe the black domestic workers who work for you, they can organize and they can vote with federal protection, without fear of harassment and violence that may have met them in the past. If you were in that situation, if you were this person so used to this kind of hierarchy, you would probably lose your mind, which is more or less what happened. Um, which I think is a way to make a, a larger point, that we tend to throw around words like freedom and liberty as if we share a common understanding and as, as, we, as, we, agree, as if we agree on what those words mean, that when we throw it out, everyone knows what we're talking about. But as Lincoln very famously observed, we all declare for liberty, but in using the same word, we do not mean all, we do not all mean the same thing. With some, the word liberty may mean for each man to do as he pleases with himself and the product of his labor, while with others, the same word may mean for some to do as they please with other men and the product of other men's labor. Here's the phrase of this that I like the most. The shepherd drives the wolf from the sheep's throat for which the sheep thinks the shepherd is a liberator, while the wolf denounces him for the same act as the destroyer of liberty. And this was the, the dynamic that I think emerged out of the New Deal and emerged out of the 1960s, that millions of Americans experienced the rights revolutions, um, first around economic rights, then around social rights. Social rights. Uh, they experienced extension of dignity and equality to labor, to women, to immigrants, to racial and sexual minorities as an expansion of their freedom to act for and realize themselves. And many, and many millions of other Americans experienced those same revolutions as an assault on their freedom, um, an assault on their freedom to dominate others, to use their liberty to establish their place in a natural hierarchy that they imagine exists. And if the 
kind of authoritarian federalism I'm describing that I think Jim Crow was and that I think the American system can still facilitate is anything. It is a way to protect and extend that freedom, of do freedom to dominate. Um, the freedom of the master you might describe it as. So for how this can be brought into being, I think you can kind of see it very clearly. Um, I think you can see it very clearly in the way our institutions are currently arranged. Um, it's possible because the counter-majoritarian institutions of the American system can be captured to shield local, local elites. And as long as those institutions are in the you know, quote unquote right hands, reactionary elites can build their hierarchies without interference from national majorities. And they might even be able to leverage them to seize national power. So we can kind of, we can kind of already witness this. Um, the Republican Party, with the help of the Supreme Court, has used state legislatures to achieve some of, this, some of these ends. After the 2010 midterm elections, the big sweep that won Republican state legislatures across the country, there were the anti-union laws that immediately swept through, both an expression of a free market and libertarian ideology, but also an attempt to keep Democrats from winning elections and to shield sort of these reactionary economic elites from the meaningful accountability that labor might provide. The Supreme Court, over the last decade, I think, has methodically worked to raise barriers to accountability to elites on the state level. It's done everything it could to both bind the federal government's ability to act and, and, and um, free the rights of states to restrict the rights of Americans. So Citizens United, right, binds the federal government's ability to act with regards to the regulation of money and politics, and then frees private actors to do whatever they want with regards to money and politics. Shelby County guts the ability of the federal government to hold states accountable to stop them from disenfranchise, disenfranchising their voters, and then frees those same states to pursue restricted voting measures as they see fit. The Supreme Court's decision not to interfere with partisan gerrymandering, again, preserves the ability of Republican-controlled states to neutralize the voting power of entire groups of people, and then says there's no remedy for this from the courts, and of course, Congress doesn't, isn't, doesn't really have the capacity at the moment to do anything about it. <coughs> the Supreme Court is also poised through its jurisprudence around the administrative state to dismantle the ability of the federal government to act proactively without con direct congressional directives. Another chance for states to be shielded from federal power, from federal intervention, from anything that could restrict the ability of elites, elites on that level to do what they want to do. I think there's something ironic about this, ironic about thinking about the states as sort of like the locus for uh, authoritarian power in the country because one of the cliches of American politics, at least as I learned it as a student, was that the states were just more democratic because they were closer to the people or something like that. This is always sort of the rationale that we got to do things at the state level because there's m more opportunities for input for ordinary people. But as, <clears throat> but as James Madison observed in the years before he became kind of a state's writer guy, and then switched back. Very com complicated politics, that guy. But at least when he was writing the Federalist Papers, he made the observation that the states were much more vulnerable to tyranny and demagoguery than a national government because they were just smaller spheres of their smaller political communities. And that's why they needed to be checked by a larger and more powerful, larger uh, political entity. And I think that still holds. I think the best example of what this can look like is what we are about to witness with regards to the end of Roe v. Wade and the end of a federal, federal protection of abortion rights, constitutional protection of abortion rights. So in his draft opinion, Sam Alito says that, you know, we're, we're just returning the rights to the states. We're just saying states can do what they choose. His, his exact wording is, in some states, voters may believe that the abortion right should be more extensive than the right that Roe and Casey recognized. In other states, voters may wish to impose tight restrictions based on their belief that abortion destroys an unborn human being. That was just, we're just doing democracy, people. Why, ever, why is everyone getting so excited about this? But that's complete nonsense, that the, the actual functional impact of overturning Roe will be 
will be to allow sort of defenders of hierarchy at the state level to seize power, to circumvent democracy in the states to impose their particular moral order. I just saw a poll this afternoon of Wisconsin voters. <clears throat> And it was something like 58% of Wisconsin voters agreed that abortion should be legal in all or most cases, like 31% most cases, 27% all cases. So a solid almost 60% majority of Wisconsin voters thought abortion should be illegal most, legal most of the time. The next largest chunk was about 30% of voters who thought, or I think it was 27, 28% of voters who thought it should be illegal in most cases, but still legal in some. And only 10% of Wisconsin voters thought abortion should be illegal in all cases. It's a total blanket ban. But because of the way that Wisconsin Republicans have gerrymandered the state, have undermined voting in the state, have been able to create a system where a 45% uh, of support from the public in a legislative election will yield the Republican Party close to 60% of the seats in the legislature. This means that the majority of Wisconsinites who do not think abortion should be illegal in their state are probably not going to have their say. Maybe the governor can veto an anti-abortion law, but if the governor loses this November, then their voices, the voices of the majority of people, will simply not matter to what the state actually does. So to think of it, or one way to, to think of it here is that the assault on abortion rights is sort of acting synergistically with the assault on voting rights, with the assault on representation, to create a situation where in Wisconsin and in other states as well, it sort of doesn't matter what the broad public thinks about the issue. What matters is how the political system has been turned into something that facilitates and allows minority rule. A state like Wisconsin has a pro-row majority. We know this. But thanks to the Supreme Court and thanks to how the institutions of American federalism and the American government work, that majority really can't realize that self, barring some uh, unprecedented political wave in its favor. And then you have to think about how the abortion bans themselves would likely result in a massive expansion of federal power, a massive expansion of state power. The state would more or less need to treat the womb um, as a potential crime scene and anything other than a healthy birth as an evidence of a possible crime. Um, so this isn't democracy, right? This, is, this, this does not resemble democracy in any sense of the word. What it is is something like an authoritarianism with the veneer of democratic institutions. Now, the Supreme Court has not yet completely eliminated the ability of the federal government to act to circumvent actions in the states. Um, but this is where other kind of majoritarian institutions come in, right? The Senate, again, where um, representation is distributed on the basis of sort of equal, equal states, uh, and where a minority of the population can, if not pass something, then just block whatever happens in the chamber. The Senate allows Republican allies of those at the state level to keep the federal government from interve intervening at all. The big picture here is to shield reactionary elites at the state level from any federal scrutiny. Uh, and where they hold power, Republicans and business elites and conservatives will kind of just have free reign to run their states as they, as they see, as, they, as, they, as little authoritarian enclaves where the opposition is largely locked out of power and where the views and preferences of most voters don't matter. Uh, another example of where this is clearly playing out is Florida where gerrymandering, where voter restrictions have essentially allowed the Florida Republican Party to govern the state without any real political challenge um, and use the power of the state to punish its enemies, uh, punish its cultural enemies, punish its political enemies, uh, eliminate districts for you know, African-American Democrats, not because there's any real reason to, but because they can. Um, and then reward their friends, reward their friends with contracts, with tax cuts, with whatever they see fit and also turn the state against uh, vulnerable minorities and use them as a scapegoat for, its, for its, other, its other actions. It's worth saying as well that this 
attempt to allow federalism to facilitate the sort of hierarchical authoritarian style of government is facilitated by a reading of the Second Amendment, which basically empowers people to intimidate, um, intimidate their political opponents in the name of liberty, carry your weapon wherever you want, um, say that if you are trying to protect the rights of ordinary Americans, then that's an infringement on my liberty, and I have the right to do something about tyranny. Now, before I move on to where I want to conclude, I want to say something else about the larger social vision at work here among this reactionary clique. Um, the image of the, their image of the future, which I think has inspired the effort to restrain democracy. And I think it is a version of this freedom of the master. It's a vision of hierarchy, which is a word I've been using a lot this evening. Um, it's a vision of traditional morality and patriarchal family structure. It's a vision where uh, empowered men, certain empowered men, have virtually unquestioned authority over the people in their lives. Uh, it's a society where social citizenship of the kind we've been trying to build over the last hundred years has more or less atrophied to non-existence and where most families and most individuals have no shelter from the forces of the market. Um, for as much as there's been for as much as there's been a group of conservatives, so-called new right these say that's speaking about the, the ills of the market, there's no serious program for protecting ordinary people from the winds of the market. And in fact, there's a very good reason why the funders and the largest voices in this authoritarian turn in the Republican Party and conservative politics, there's a good reason why these are uh, billionaires, often billionaires of closely held companies, people like the Trumps, the Koch brothers, Koch brothers, um, the Mercers. There's a reason why they are enthusiastic about this because it fits with their vision of how they operate in the market and in the social system. Powerful billionaire owners of family companies that can act with total impunity and do whatever they want. Um, both groups, social conservatives, uh, who are kind of the, 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 the ground level troops of this and the billionaires behind them, have a vested interest in this notion of the traditional family as the building block for their preferred political and economic regimes. Um, for the social conservative the traditional family enforces these hierarchies of gender and status, and for the billionaires and the owners of capital, the traditional family can be kind of the, the, the vehicle for undermining the social safety net and undermining the federal administrative state that sustains it. In this vision, government is forced back, it's eliminated, the private sector is fully unleashed to do whatever it pleases, and the patriarchal traditional family, largely disciplined by market forces, um, lies at the foundation. People are have to struggle and scrape to survive, and that kind of for, uh, precludes serious political action on their part to make something better of the world. The, some of these um, self-styled national conservatives we referenced early, they to me seem pretty open about all of this. It doesn't seem like they have any illusions about the kind of world they want. They, there was a recent statement of principles, um, a group of them put out and they had a statement about federalism. I'll just read one of the concluding paragraphs of, <clears throat> we believe in a strong but limited state subject to constitutional restraints and division of powers. We recommend the federalist principle, which prescribes a delegation of power to the respective states or subdivisions of the nation, so as, to allow, so as to allow greater variation, experimentation, and freedom. However, in those states or subdivisions in which law or justice have been manifestly corrupted or in which lawlessness, immorality, and dissolution reign, national government must intervene energetically to restore order. Lawlessness, immorality, and dissolution. I really wonder what those might mean. Doesn't sound like they mean anything good for most people. In their vision, and I think in this vision I'm describing, the national government won't have the power to protect the rights of Americans, but it will have the power to crush them when necessary. So um, with all of that said, the reason I want to sketch this vision out, the reason I want to kind of think about the future of American democracy and the future of democratic deterioration in terms of 
the problems of federalism and the problems of American institutions um, is to help think about what it would take to turn back the tide, to do something about it, to preclude this sort of future from coming to pass. Um, so much of the conversation over threats to American democracy, I think, are just focused on the wrong problems. They're focused on the morality of individual Americans. They're focused on disinformation. They're focused, as I said, on Trump, on, on the problem of conspiracy theories. And all these things are problems. They are all issues. But I think if we think deeply about this, we'll see that the problem is much more fundamental, that the problem is the Constitution. It is what the Constitution allows to exist. Um, it's the Constitution and how it restrains democratic impulses among Americans, and it's the Constitution and how it enables bad actors to subvert democracy and oppose their vision on the rest of us. And just in the last 20 years, we see how this has worked out. If not for the Electoral College, you wouldn't have President Trump. If not for the Senate and its filibuster, majorities of Americans would have been able to pass legislation to protect the right to vote, uh, protect the right to organize a union, protect the right to an abortion, um, address issues like climate change and rampant inequality. We'd be able to do these things if the Senate mostly didn't stand in the way. And if not for the Supreme Court and judicial review, if not for those things, we could do a whole lot as a society. Um, one of, I, it's, I, I hesitate to call it one of my favorite tidbits, but an interesting tidbit is that in the 1870s, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act, Civil Rights Act of 1875. It outlawed discrimination in public accommodations and prohibited exclusion from jury service. It was very similar um, in its basics to what would become the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And a decade after its passage, the court had either invalidated it or rendered it, uh, invalidated its provisions or rendered them a dead letter. Uh, in the decade after that, of course, the support gave the thumbs up to Jim Crow segregation. So if you kind of set aside some of the landmark rulings of the 50s and the 60s, um, the court, which often were unraveling the work of previous courts, the court has just been an obstacle to the rights of Americans and to realizing those rights to the democratic process. Our Constitution, um, I'm going to describe it as our kind of janky and, and jury-rigged Constitution, um, which is struggle to hold up in the year since it was written and ratified is the problem. Um, and if there is going to be a future of American democracy, assuming we get through the next few years more or less intact, then I think that we're going to have to do something about it. What that something is, I'd have, I have my own ideas and my own hobby horses, but I'm also very aware that the process of constitution making cannot be the product of a single mind. It is a collaborative process. It is a deliberative process. Uh, and importantly, it's a process that I think Americans are still very capable of doing. I kind of alluded to this last night, but whenever I talk about this idea of changing the Constitution or writing a new Constitution, the response is often one of two things. Either some, very, either some version of, we should not mess with perfection, which, come on, let's be serious, or there's no way we could do better, that even with all of its flaws, this is kind of the best we're going to get. <clears throat> but I reject that. I reject that completely. First of all, there was a generation of Americans, the civil rights generation, whose amendments arguably did a better job than the framers themselves. And more importantly, the framers weren't demigods. They were just ordinary men in extraordinary times. <coughs> and while there were some who were unusually wise and unusually perceptive, every age has its people who are unusually wise and unusually perceptive. And on the negative side of the ledger, we shouldn't forget that this document was designed by people who, even the best of them, were slave owners and speculators and, you know, syphilis-ridden rich people. So <laughs> we, really need to, we really need to take them not just off of a pedestal, but like put them on our level and recognize that if they could do it, then with our experience and with our knowledge and with our sense of, what, of how democracies can work, then we can do it as well. <clears throat> 
I say I don't just think that Americans can do it and create a constitution, a better constitution than the one we have. I, 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 I think that it is a, a very feasible thing if we take the process seriously, if um, we really sat down and tried to create something that lived up to our intuitions, to our aspirations, and to our ideals. At the very least, I think this is something we need to try. Because as it stands, the Constitution we have is not really working for the democracy that we want. Thank you. Time for questions. Um, please come up and ask a question, and I'll try to answer it. And um, yeah, we'll go from there. Thank you. Um, you did say it was going to be not entirely pessimistic, though. Um, <clears throat> so I need to ask, what institutions can organizers best exploit at the state level, anywhere, to promote democracy at the state level or anywhere. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I think the the institutions that can be most easily exploited still are just state legislative elections, which in a lot of places involve very few people coming to the polls, um, uh, not that much organization, and it is often very possible to, you know, lots of places, seats that are just not contested. I live in Virginia. And in the 2017 elections, I believe, were the first elections in some time where Democrats contested more or less every single House of Delegates seat. And they didn't win all of them. Um, they didn't win a majority. But they did two things. First is they forced the state Republican Party to really have to compete for their votes um, where they were running. And second, and I think this is underrated, that competing everywhere can help the top of the ticket by bringing out voters who might otherwise not be engaged. And it builds pathways and infrastructure for the next election. I don't think that the solution is going to be purely electoral, but I do think that if there is an electoral um, part of it, it, is, it has to include kind of a, a comprehensive effort to contest every election that is held. That is more or less what the right did, ran in everything. And precisely because the threshold to winning gets lower as the, you know, the level of power goes down, um, it becomes very easy to capture a whole lot of power with relatively little effort. The, the, um, I'll say the liberal preoccupation with the presidency over the last generation has just been a disaster, um, just a straight up disaster. Hello again. Um, Hi. I loved your closing line about how the Constitution we have is not providing us with the democracy we want. But having said that, I've always found it ironic that by law we're required to pay taxes, but we're not required to vote. And so I was wondering, to tie this back to what you said last night, if such a mandate, if you want to call it that, can put us on a path to political equality. Thank you. So um, I, th I think this came up last night, and I think my answer about it was that I, I myself have grown much more comfortable with the idea of mandatory voting and sort of like I've had to suppress my libertarian side a bit um, and embrace the idea that it might make sense just to have mandatory voting. But also, it's this sort of thing where the kind of United States in which it was possible to pass a law mandating voting seems like the kind of place that is like organized itself to be much more progressive than it are than it currently is. If that makes any sense, like the level of organization, the level of activism that it would take to make mandatory voting a reality um, would suggest a world in which maybe mandatory voting isn't even necessary. Um, sort of a it's a it's a it's a strange. It's like, it's like a similar issue with like the question of reparations, right? Like the world in which reparations happen is just like a much more progressive world than the one we live in. And arguably is the kind of world where like maybe reparations weren't necessary. 
Um, and so I think in the abstract, mandatory voting would be a good thing. Would at least sort of, by creating the possibility that all voters are going to be engaged, because obviously in a, in a world of mandatory voting, you don't have to cast a ballot. You just have to kind of go out and say that you went to the polls. That's how it works in Australia. Um, but that would, I think, do, that would, I think that would change the calculus for elected officials and for political parties. Um, but I think the kind of work you would need to get to the point where that is on the table um, might be, it might be better served looking at other ways to change the institution of the United States, if that makes sense. Um, two more questions, yeah. That's what that meant. <laughs> First of all, thank you for your very uh, inspiring and elusive uh, talk. Uh, I had a series of questions just out of curiosity. Uh, when you say the democracy we want, who is the we you are referring to? Uh, when you talk about jury rigging elections, are you suggesting that only Republicans do that? Uh, and uh, I guess the last question I have is in terms of the solution, are you suggesting that we just do away with all state governments and have just national majorities decide everything? Thank you. Um, so when I say we, I, I sort of mean how Americans, you know, both how Americans express their values in like public opinion surveys and, and stuff like that, but also just how Americans seem to want to live their lives. Americans um, seem to take for granted, right, that we have certain rights, that we have certain um, privileges, uh, that the government can't do X, Y, or Z, and people are often shocked when they learn that, that the, the reverse is true. So I think there, that there are a set of assumptions that Americans carry about their democracy and about, their, about democratic life that aren't necessarily borne out in how the system actually uh, is set up and how the system actually works. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of that? Could you, could you just like say that again real quick? I just forgot, sorry. Gerrymandering. Or it wasn't gerrymandering or something. Yes. I mean, both parties do it. I think it's much more egregious. Now I remember the other part of it. Um, that it was, do I think we should just eliminate the states? And the short answer is yes, I do. Um, during the Constitutional Convention, there was not, I wouldn't say there was a live debate, but part of the conversation was what exactly was the nature of a state government. Um, you had framers like James Wilson, even to an extent Madison, make the point that, listen, the national government acts on individuals. And that the states, it doesn't really, the idea that the states need representation as states doesn't really make any sense. And I think that that was right for political reasons, for kind of reasons of path dependency, they were not going to get rid of states as these sort of like quasi-independent entities. That's sort of how uh, they were formed um, as, you know, colonies originally, and that's sort of how things shaped up. But in theory, at least, there's, there's no reason for states to have as much authority and power as they do. They could act essentially like cities do now, right? State governments have pretty much total dominion over cities. The city is a, cr a creation of the state. And in the same way, I think we should think of states as a creation of the federal union, um, which would imply much less authority and leeway for the ability of states to do whatever, and much more influence and authority for the national government. And although I think that so often sounds very uncomfortable to Americans, I think that U.S. history is a pretty good demonstration of how when it, when it comes down to it, the national government and national majorities have been much more reliable protectors of the liberties and freedoms of individual Americans than the states ever have. Hi there. Uh, if you could add one amendment that went into effect tomorrow, what would it be? That's a good question. Um, um, this, this is gonna sound uh, a little strange. But, so the one unamendable part of the Constitution is equal representation of states in the Senate. Um, but there's a way you could get around that by essentially amending the part of the Constitution that says that you can't 
change representation of the Senate, basically kind of rewrite Article 5. And that's what I would do. That's what I would do. Um, uh, uh, barring that, it would probably be sort of like a, a guaranteed right to privacy or like an omnibus amendment that was like right to privacy, right to vote, and the Senate doesn't count anymore. There you go. <laughs> um, I think that is it for questions, and that's it for this evening. So thank you so much for coming out.